Welcome to the BAA Wednesday webinar on the 9th of June 2021. As usual, we're holding it on Zoom and live streaming to YouTube. Uh, the recording will be available to watch on our YouTube channel shortly after the webinar. And you can ask questions by typing into the Q&A on Zoom or in the comments on YouTube and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. It's my pleasure to hand over to Callum Potter, Director of the BAA Deep Sky Section. Thank you, Andy. Um, so yeah, welcome to this uh, BA Web Wednesday webinar. Um, very pleased uh, tonight to uh, be able to bring to you one of the uh, foremost uh, amateur astronomers from uh, uh, across the pond in the USA, uh, Howard Banich. Um, Howard's uh, based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, has been an avid amateur astronomer since 1969, it says in his, his bio. Um, currently a contributing editor to Sky and Telescope magazine, so you've probably read some of his articles there. Uh, it's also published in Amateur Astronomy magazine and Amateur Telescope Making Journal. Um, he's also a telescope maker, so very much uh, another thing to my heart, uh, and owner of several, and his uh, largest scope to date is a 28-inch F4 Altazimuth Newtonian. Um, which uh, on the pictures I've seen on the web looks like a fantastic um, telescope. Um, tonight, uh, Howard's going to talk to us about uh, deep sky sketching, drawing in the dark. So I'll pass straight over to, to Howard for his presentation. Over to you, Howard. Thank you, Callum. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure to, to be here talking to you all. Um, as Callum said, that uh, my presentation today is about sketching deep sky objects. Uh, just wanted to uh, make a, a few notes before we get into the body of the presentation about the, the photograph that you're seeing now. Um, the seated figure, hopefully you can see my uh, cursor, that's me, at the, uh, at the eyepiece of my 28 inch telescope. And I'm sketching the Lagoon Nebula. And the Lagoon Nebula is one of my main um, objects through the presentation that I, I use to demonstrate my process of sketching. So actually you see me in action doing what I'll, I'll be demonstrating here in just a little bit. And, um, you know, Callum kind of made this, this slide a, a little redundant. Um, I actually live not in Portland anymore, but uh, just outside to the Northwest of Portland. And, um, one of the, the most frequently asked questions I get anytime I'm on Zoom is where the heck am I? Okay, and I'm in the, the state of Oregon on the west coast of the US. Um, it's the Pacific Ocean. California is immediately to the south. Most people know where that is. And then the state of Washington to the north. This is Portland, Oregon, biggest city in the state. I live right about here. These are the Cascade Mountains and this whole section of the state here is high desert with a few mountain ranges and it's very, very dark. 80% of the people in the state live here in the Willamette Valley. So this is very dark, pretty much anywhere you go. Great place to escape to go observing to. All right, so presentation. This is about why I sketch deep sky objects and how I sketch them. Primarily about how I, how I sketch them. I, my process. And you know, it's important to emphasize that this is the way I do it. Um, it's not the way I think everyone should do it. We, we're all very different. You know, most people don't sketch. That, that's totally fine. Um, but I, I, I have you know, a certain process and some people have found it to be useful to, to inform how they go about it as well. So why? Um, I like to have a permanent record of what I've seen. It's fun to go back and look at my observations of a particular object going back to 1974. And it's interesting to see just how many times I've actually observed a single object. It's just really enjoyable for me. And, uh, and just as importantly, uh, through the years, I realized that sketching actually improves my observing skill. And how does that happen? Well, it's, it's basically sketching is a, a formalized way of focusing your attention on something. 
and, and the example on the screen here is one I like to, to use because it's, it's something I think we can relate to fairly easily. If you try to imagine the face of someone you know really well, just in your mind, like close your eyes, and then ask yourself you know, the three questions there, the, the shape of their face, you know, which eye is slightly higher than the other, what color are their eyes? You know, you may not know that, but if you made a sketch of that person's face, you would know those things instantly because through the process of making the sketch, you would have attended to every detail of that person's face and it would just be embedded in your mind because of that. Okay, now every presentation tends to have one main point it tries to make it, and this is mine. If, if you remember nothing else about what I have to say this evening, this is what I hope you remember is that sketching is a discipline to focus your attention and it has nothing to do about art. It's all about seeing all that you can. That's how I, that's how I look at it because I wanna see all I can through my telescopes and sketching is the way I can do that. Okay, but it's not easy to do. Um, okay, I'm in, I'm in the dark, I have a dim red light and I'm sketching something I can barely see. I'm usually holding my flashlight in my teeth. My note, notebook is in my left hand and my pencil is in my right hand. Um, my observing eye is closed while I'm making my sketch in my notebook. I'm often standing on a ladder like you see in the, the photograph on, on the right. And it's often cold, windy and uh, dewy or all three. So it is probably the, the most difficult conditions to, to try to sketch anything, but it's, it's the, the end result is so worth it to me that all those other factors just blend into the background. Okay. Uh, I like these two photos. This is kind of a, a before and, and now, or then and now. Uh, the, the photo on the left is me when I'm about 12 years old. That is my three inch F15 Tasco refractor. Uh, that is a stray cat from somewhere. I don't know where it came from. <laughs> it wasn't our cat. And I'm looking at a uh, partial solar eclipse. And you can tell I'm a novice because I have the polar axis of that, of that telescope pointed at the sun. I still hadn't figured out how to use the equatorial mountain. Um, and then that's me more recently, just from a few years ago, uh, standing next to my 28 inch F4 telescope that I built and that I primarily use today. So uh, the point of this slide though, is that it doesn't, the size of the telescope isn't that important. Um, being comfortable using it and having a tracking telescope preferably makes the whole observing and sketching process so much more enjoyable. And the more comfortable one is, the more you're able to see. So I've seen too many really big telescopes that are uncomfortable or awkward to use. And, you know, yeah, you peek in the eyepiece and you might see some really cool stuff, but it's not, you can't savor the view. You can't get into the details of the view because either you have a stiff neck or it's the, the positioning of the ladder is awkward and it's just not something that, that works out well. So comfort while observing is, is an important thing to consider. Okay, now this is a page from my sketching notebook or my observing notebook more, more accurately. So I take notes and sketch in it. Um, you know, this is just to show that um, I, I don't use a form like this where you have a, an IP circle and then a, a place to make notes. This, this, for me, this is too constricting. Um, it's, it's difficult for me to have only a certain small space on a page to be able to sketch. So sometimes I sketch something big and it kind of bleeds over into the next page like, like you see here. Um, you know, or I make certain notes that maybe, the, maybe only this was in the field of view and this I had to move the telescope over to, to see the next part. So I don't like these forms. Some people thrive using them. 
So it's my, my point here is to, if you haven't tried sketching yet, try a form like this. It might may work beautifully for you. And it, it may not. Just it's important to try different things until you find your own method that you're comfortable with. Okay, so part one of how I sketch. So I hope everyone's comfortable. Um, the, the first step, um, a little counterintuitive perhaps of, of sketching is to not sketch. Um, observe the object. I mean, don't, don't even try to, to sketch it at first. You know, look at it, you know, see what you can see, get a feel for it, you know, get, get a really good picture of it in your mind um, after you examine the basic qualities. And then once you have a good mental image of that, then start your sketch from memory. And then once you have that first version on, on in your notebook, go back to the eyepiece and then start the iterative process of adding little bits to the sketch, looking in the eyepiece again and going back and forth and do that until you, you feel you've seen everything you can see and almost invariably. I mean, there, there are some exception, exceptions, of course. The, your sketch will have more detail, sometimes considerably more detail than when you saw in your first observation. And this just, you know, the demonstration of, of the, the power of sketching to focus your attention. All right, so now uh, kind of a, a concrete example. Okay, this is a, a rough pencil sketch that I made of an edge on galaxy. Let's call it NGC 4565, just for the heck of it. I just doodle it down on a piece of paper here at my desk. Um, you can see all the pencil lines. It's just kind of rough looking and yeah, but you can tell, okay, that's an edge on galaxy. But that really isn't what 4565 looks like in the eyepiece. Okay, so the first thing I do after getting that, that rough sketch on, on the paper is I use my little finger usually, sometimes it's my index finger, to smudge the pencil lead on the paper, to blend it in, to get rid of those individual pencil lines. And what that does is that just gives a more realistic look. And then sometimes I use this cleaning bag. And this is a, a thing I found at, uh, um, I've been using this since high school. It was actually, I came across it in, in drafting class and it's used to clean up stray pencil marks and to use as a, as a light erasing uh, uh, implement. Basically it's a, it's a small cloth bag full of eraser shavings, which you can see on the piece of paper and um, on the bag itself. And it's gentle, or you can kind of squish it down and use it to, to erase a little more um, directly, but it's a wonderful tool to, to clean up, you know, straight pencil lines and to get a more realistic look here. And then here, uh, just showing adding a few more pencil highlights. And one one thing that uh, just occurred to me just before I uh, started this presentation and I did one last run through of, of this to myself is that I neglected to add a picture of well, how did I get that that dark lane? running through the center of the galaxy. Well, that is, it's that red implement here. This is an eraser pencil that is tapered at the edge. And I just use that very gently to run down through the center here to simulate the dark lane. So now I have a more realistic looking sketch of NGC 4565. And you know, I know that makes it look really easy. And a lot of people are, are perhaps thinking to themselves that I can't draw a straight line. And, um, you know, maybe so. But again, this isn't about art. I've been doing this since 1974. So I, I have, uh, I've been practicing for quite a long time. So my results are, are looking pretty good to me these days. They didn't look so good in the beginning. And uh, you'll see an example of that here in a little bit. But this just is to show, you know, some of the basic steps that it takes to end up with a, a fairly decent looking notebook sketch of 
a hedge-on galaxy like 4565. It's very basic tools. You know, when I'm at the eyepiece, I just I'm just using the the pencil, and I'm going to go back. That that is generally what my my original notebook sketch looks like when I'm uh, finished observing. The next day, I go back and do these steps. So I don't end up with a nice looking sketch right away at the eyepiece. Okay, so part two. And here is an example from 1974 to show how my, my first attempts at deep sky sketching turned out. Um, not as pretty looking as they do now. <laughs> This actually is my, my best version of, uh, of the Lagoon Nebula from 1974. I have several. The, the first three are, are pretty terrible. This is by far the best one. But you can I mean, just look at it. You can see okay, those, those stars aren't round looking. The, the, the nebula is not very nebulous looking. But it's obviously the Lagoon Nebula. And this is with a uh, through an 8-inch F4. Newtonian that I made when I was 14 and uh, glad to say I still have and use. <clears throat> Pardon me. So, but this, this section is about how do I go from a sketch like I just showed of you know, 4565 to a drawing. And to me, I define a drawing as a finished version of a sketch. So it's like my best attempt to portray what I saw through the telescope um, with pencil. And then the finished rendering is when I digitize the, uh, the, the final pencil sketch, pen, pencil drawing, uh, either with a scanner or through photography. And then I bring it into a, uh, a Photoshop-like uh, program. I use GIMP, G-I-M-P. And uh, does say all the same things as Photoshop does to make it to make the final result look as realistic looking as I can currently do. Um, still, still not super realistic though. I have room for improvement for sure. Okay, so the process um, for and this is for Lagoon Nebula. This is a, a large complex object for a small simple. Elliptical galaxy, well, you don't need to make a, uh, a template. It's just a, usually a round looking piece of fuzz in, in the eyepiece that's pretty easy to, to draw. There's no real detail there. But for something like the Lagoon Nebula, um, I start with a photograph and make a template using tracing paper. But I, I just trace the, the, a, the outline around the border and mark the locations of the brighter stars just to give me the overall proper proportions. And for a complex object like the Lagoon, that's important. It's really easy to get out of proportion and the whole drawing ends up looking crazy if you don't start off with the correct proportions. So that's why I start with the photograph and, and tracing paper. So I get that established on, on my uh, uh, on my paper, and then I add details and refine that drawing by the iterative process at the eyepiece. And sometimes that takes me six, seven, eight observing sessions. Uh, sometimes that can happen all in a week. Sometimes that happens over several years. It just depends on how, uh, how kind the weather um, is to me and uh, how I can get out and to observe. Sometimes I uh, consult a photograph, looking for subtle features to see if I can add, if I can see them and add them to my sketch, but I only add them if I can really see them. You know, there are times that I'll, I'll, I'll admit that I'm tempted to add a feature because it would look so cool to add to my sketch, but if I don't see it, I, it's just not added to the paper. Um, and, and really at the end of the night, when it's all said and done, you know, having only what I've been able to actually see on the paper is more meaningful than trying to copy a photograph. 
So after each night, um, in the light of day, I'll, I'll clean up the sketch. Invariably, there are stray pencil marks everywhere. There's smudges, the, the stars are out around, like you saw in my 1974 sketch of the lagoon. Um, and I just keep keep going out that process until I'm happy or I'm or I'm I'm sure that I've seen all I'm going to see. Um, and it's really a virtuous cycle. And one of the side benefits of doing this and becoming and getting the sketch built up over time is that a familiarity is 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 bred with with the object. I mean, I I know the Lagoon Nebula now, um, and any other object I've gone through this entire process with. It's it's a it's a process of, of not only familiarization, but it's like it's similar to you driving to some place you've never been before and you, you're checking your GPS, you know, you turn here, you turn there. Um, but after you've gone there for a few times, you don't need to look at that. You just know where to go. It's somewhat analogous to that. The, the more observing and sketching on an object like the lagoon, that's, that's complex, um, the more you become familiar with it and you know it, and you're able to see some of the fainter features you may not have seen before on a night when the conditions aren't as as good as they were when you initially saw them. So it's really a wonderful process, and and the the, the whole um, eye brain process of seeing becomes more honed in just because of this. Okay, so. I just added this, this slide last night because it, it occurred to me that there really are two ways to approach sketching the same object on multiple nights. Um, you can do a new sketch each time, um, which, you know, totally a good way to do it. it. It takes more time. Or what I do is I just keep adding to my original sketch. Um, sometimes that, that means, you know, I need to started over though because i'll end up seeing so much i realize i need to make my sketch larger because there's detail that i just hadn't noticed before that was too small and one of the rules of thumb in sketching is to have a size your sketch so that the smallest part of of the objects that that you're that you're drawing can be shown well and sometimes that means you have to use a fairly large piece of paper. My normal notebook is um, five and a half by, by eight inches when it's opened up. So it's a fairly small notebook. But when I do a complex object, which you'll see here in a minute, I use fairly large uh, clipboards just for that reason. And here you go, right away. Um, you can kind of see uh, my, my fingers right here along the edge there to give you a sense of the scale of, of the clipboard. It's, it's fairly large. And uh, that is my latest IP sketch of the Lagoon Nebula from August of 2019 through my 28 inch scope. And this, this drawing was done over six nights at the Oregon Star Party in uh, 2019. And uh, I was fortunate to have just absolutely perfect conditions almost every night to, to do this. So, okay, so there's, there's my IP sketch. You know, I, I didn't zoom in on it here because, frankly, it looks better from far away. Um, <laughs> you don't see all the flaws. But the next, get, the next step from here is to redraw it on better paper. This is drawn, this is the, the, the paper this is drawn on here is really thin tracing paper. Because as I described before, you know, I drew the outline of the lagoon on here to start and put in some of the brighter stars as reference points. So this paper, you can see it gets wavy and kind of wrinkly. So I redraw it on really nice vellum paper, which stays really flat. And so every detail I saw and then recorded in my, my IP sketch is redrawn here. And at 
uh, a little a little easier to, to see too because the, the wrinkles in the paper or the tracing paper are really pretty distracting. So this is nice and flat. This is a photograph of that finished pencil drawing. And I'll just mention here that taking a photograph of a, of a drawing is one of the easiest things in the world to do, but it's one of the hardest things in the world to do to get an even illumination. It's, it's, all, it's so difficult to not have a, a gradient. You can see here in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the, 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 the tone of the paper here compared down to the lower left-hand corner, which is much lighter looking. It's, it's difficult to get a perfectly smooth background. Um, I know, you know astrophotographers sometimes have a similar problem, but uh, certainly for, for uh, it's an unexpected thing that I came across that photographing my, my drawing would end up having the, the same type of uh, difficulty. So anyway, um, pretty much what I just said there at the beginning, I've redrawn my IP sketch, which, you, which you've just seen as the finished pencil drawing. And in, in this case, I photographed it. So my next step is to enhance my my drawing in GIMP or whatever um, uh, fo like Photoshop or whatever program you you like to use uh, that, that can do the things you want it to do. Um, and the whole idea here is that I'm my my attempt is to make my finished drawing look more like what I actually saw in the eyepiece. Because um, because really, okay, this is a negative image. I mean, that's not what I saw. I saw a positive image. I saw, you know, bright nebula on a black background. And this is the opposite of that. So that's not what I saw. This records the detail I saw, but it's not what I saw. Now, some people draw on black paper using white pencils and, and white uh, media. I've, I've never tried it. I've seen some wonderful results that way. I've always, Again, this is just how I do it. Um, and then I've listed the, the tools in GIMP that I tend to use the most. Um, invert turns my negative pencil sketch into a positive image, you know, black background, bright object. Um, and I almost always make the, the, the finished digital image with higher contrast than what I saw. So even the faintest detail that I saw can be easily seen in the finished rendering. Uh, yeah, another part of that that, that that eventually led me to this is that in the articles that I've written for Sky and Telescope, you know, publishing one of my drawings in the magazine has not yet turned out to look the way I wanted it to. The, the publishing process makes it either more contrasty or less contrasty, but 99% of the time less contrasty. So I've just gradually added a little more contrast. So in the magazine, my drawing will actually show up. Okay, so this is my first run at um, through GIMP. I've taken my pencil sketch and I've basically removed all the pencil lines and the nebula looks more nebulous now. Again, we'll go back here. You can see the pencil lines in here. You can see the, the texture of the vellum paper. It's very fine paper, but it still has texture. And you can, if you look closely, hopefully this is coming across. Maybe this up here shows it the best, but this is obviously a, a pencil drawing. Okay, all those lines are gone now. And okay, this is looking more like what I saw. But again, this is still a negative image. So the next step is to invert it. Ah, okay, now we're getting somewhere. This is much more like what I saw. Uh, black background, you know, the nebula is shining brightly. The stars of the, uh, of the uh, lagoons cluster show up really nicely. This, this, 
this is, um, I'm, I'm really happy with it at this point, but this isn't, there's still a little bit more to add here because the lagoon under a really dark sky in a 28 inch telescope shows a little color. And, and this is much closer to what I saw at low power. Um, it has in, in, in the brightest area, this is uh, the, the hourglass area, region of the uh, lagoon. It's the brightest part of the nebulosity and it has a warm yellowish hue to it that only seen on the very best nights, but it's just absolutely lovely to see. And on a night like that, the, the nebula with the embedded star cluster just has this three dimensional appearance that is impossible to for me to convey in, in a rendering. I'm really happy with how this rendering turned out. You know, even though it's not exactly what I saw in the eyepiece, it records everything I saw over six nights in the most realistic way I know how. So this, this is one of my, my best efforts right there. Okay, now, the lagoon is really nice overall, but the best part is right in the middle, like I was talking about the hourglass region. And I made a separate IP sketch of just that region. And you can see here, this is the actual dark nebula that gave Messier 8 its, its nickname, the lagoon. And this right here is the hourglass, which we'll zoom in on. This is my finished pencil drawing. This might show the, uh, the texture of the vellum paper even better than the overall sketch, especially looking in here, maybe over here. Um, I'm really happy with, with this pencil sketch, but you can also see I haven't cropped it yet. You can see the edges of my drawing. So this is cropped and it, he, he, now you can really see the uh, texture of the paper. And by the way, this is this star right here is the Herschel 36. And this star is, is highly obscured and reddened as uh, the, prof the professionals like to, to say, but it is the primary star that photo ionizes the Lagoon Nebula. Even though it doesn't look like the brightest one, um, in actuality, it, it's putting out huge amounts of ultraviolet light causing the lagoon to be as visible as it is. Okay, so now this, I've gone through the, the same steps I did for the, um, the entire Lagoon Nebula here. Again, showing, okay, the, the hourglass, which is a, just a, a wonderful object to study at high power. To, to get this level of detail with my 28 inch scope, I was using about 400 power, the magnification of 400 and um the it's just a mesmerizing area uh there's just so much here but there's a lot of subtle detail through the nebulosity through here that is really difficult to capture i did my best but i i, I really kind of fell short in this uh in this close-up and in some of the, the the more subtle detail further away from the hourglass the hourglass is pretty good I have to, to say that, um, but th this whole area here, it's just, and it it's, turns out to be a very turbulent area. Uh, there's a lot of motion within the uh, nebulosity here, primarily caused by the intense ultraviolet radiation from Herschel 36. All right, so, okay. So like anything else, the only way to get better is to practice. Um, this slide is just to show some doodles I did one day. I don't know if I was at work being bored and had nothing better to do, <laughs> but I just started to, to sketch these. These um, I just started with a, like a, a ball. I don't know why. Um, and I just tried to make it look as spherical as I could. And then I, I went on to a elliptical galaxy and then a highly tilted galaxy and then an edge on galaxy. And then I don't know if you can see, but just progressively fainter smudges. 
This one barely shows up at all. Um, but you know, this is a valuable thing to do. You know, if, if you're getting into sketching, this to practice during the day. It's really hard to sketch at night. Um, like I previously mentioned, using a, a dim red light at night and preserving your, your, your dark adaptation. Uh, this is one of the more difficult ways to go about drawing anything. So if you can practice during the day and get a feel for you know, putting your, your pencil to paper however you want to draw, whatever your, your preferred medium is, you know, being comfortable with it during the day will help you immensely at night when you're at the telescope. So practice, practice, practice. And also it's kind of fun. Um, you know, I'm retired now, so I'm able to observe a lot more, which is fun. So I don't have to do the, the daytime doodles anymore. Uh, I can doodle at night, which is very nice. Okay, if you want to see a selection of my best deep sky drawings, there's the, um, the URL. And um, these are almost entirely drawings that I've done that have been published in Sky and Telescope magazine. As I mentioned in a slide way back towards the beginning of, of this presentation, um, 95% of my sketches just stay in my sketchbook. And that's just the way they end up looking. They, they, they don't go through that, that whole process about turning it into a, a finished rendering. Those are only for the, the, art, the articles that I write about those, those objects. And, and that, that image goes along with, with the article. So it's a, uh, uh, it's a fun, fun thing to go flip through. Uh, you can get an idea of the, the range of the objects that I look at. You also see some of my planetary images and a few comet uh, sketches as well. And again, you know, my main point, just to underline it one more time, sketching is all about focusing your attention. It's a discipline to focus your attention. And I, I chose the word discipline purposely because it, it is. You have to concentrate while you're doing this. I mean, the word focus certainly connotes that, but um, you need to take your time. You know, a sketch may take you a half an hour you know, from the time you begin. Um, if, if, if you find the idea of spending 30 minutes on one object to be an insane amount of time, well, you might be surprised if you, if you do it while you're sketching because the time zooms right by. And for those of you who can't draw a straight line, that's fine. You're, so what if your sketch doesn't look anything like what you just saw? The process you've gone through to, to put whatever you have on paper down will ensure that you've seen everything that you can. And this is the whole point. If you end up with a with a beautiful looking drawing, all the better. But this is all about seeing all you can. So thank you very much. Um, I'll take any questions now. Thank you, Howard. Um, that was fascinating. Uh, those are really wonderful sketches. And <laughs> I think often my, my attempts look more like your 1974. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh... My mind mind it for a long time. <laughs> practice, practice, practice. They're very informative. Um, if anyone wants to ask questions, you can type them in the QA on Zoom or the comments on YouTube. Um, just whilst people are writing their questions, a little plug for the next BAA webinar, which is going to be the BAA summer webinar. Instead of having a meeting, we're having that on Saturday, the 26th of June. At 11 o'clock, we've got Dr. Nicholas Pareto on the earliest stages of stellar cluster formation. And at 2.30, it's Dr. Amy Bonsor on planet-eating white dwarves. Um, and if you're interested in radio astronomy, then the next radio astronomy section, Zoom, is on Friday the 25th of June at 7.15 in the evening. And that's on the tricky question of pulsars by Peter East, OBE, FRNG. Um, I see we've had a couple of questions come in, or three questions now, on Zoom. 
So the first one's from Daryl Dobbs, and he asks, do you use more than one grade of pencil? Uh, actually, no. Um, I, I use... I use a mechanical pencil. I, this is actually is pencil I generally use. It uses 0.7 millimeter lead, HB lead, which is a little on the dark side. Uh, it draws a little on the darker side. Um, I, I have found that using a darker lead and a pencil eraser and my eraser bag um, is, is a really gives me the type of control that uh, I like to have. But, and the good thing about a mechanical pencil is that it always stays fairly sharp as opposed to a wood pencil so you need to keep sharpening. Oh, that, that's interesting. Yeah, well, kind of when I've done sketching, I've tended to use sort of B, B pencils and the kind of ones you have to sharpen in a sharpener, which uh, doesn't always work well in the evenings. No, no, it's, it's a good way to keep it simple using a mechanical pencil. Um, the next question is from Nick Hewitt. He has uh, brilliant. Um, how do you keep your stars looking so neat? <laughs> and I'd really like to know the answer to that as well. <laughs> um, well, well, thank you, Nick. Um, yeah, the, um, that 1974 sketch of the lagoon is my, 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 my initial star images when I'm at the eyepiece still look pretty much like that. <laughs> that hasn't improved. Um, I clean those up the next day. Um, and, and, and basically with, with my pencil, I'll go back and I'll, I'll erase most of that starlight, that squiggle that's supposed to be a round star. And uh, I'll redraw it as neatly as I can at about the, the, the same size and, and darkness as, uh, as it should have been. Now in my finished renderings, I will then use a, a tool in GIMP that uh, a paintbrush tool that makes, you know, circles of various sizes and various um, hardnesses and various um, blurs around the edge to make the finished rendering stars look, look so neat. So that, that's basically a, I'll just kind of put that over my, my pencil drawn stars because they're, they're always perfectly circular. And because even my best efforts with, with the pencil will, will often be somewhat oval looking. And um, so uh, e even though for most people they say, oh, that looks just fine. Well, I like to have them look, look round. You know, just like astrophotographers like round stars. So um, yeah, so that's how I do it. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that's a useful trick. Yes. It's, it's pretty quick and easy, too. Yeah, it's, it's good to know uh, we're not the only ones who have, have trouble getting the stars oh, looking good. It's, it's the hardest part. Um, next, we have a question from uh, David Arditi. Um, and he'd like to know, do you think you are influenced by having seen CCD images of the objects? And do you try to guard against this? Absolutely, yes. I am influenced by seeing all these beautiful images. There's no way not to be. Uh, in fact, I have a whole other presentation about just that um, because it's, it's really kind of a pernicious problem, a problem, you know, in a way, um, because anything we look at through our telescopes, we can look up on the web and find any number of fantastic images so we go to our telescope knowing what it looks like. In the 19th century astronomers, before photography came in, into to use, general use, they didn't know what these things look like. Um, they were making their sketches in the blind. They, they were sketching what they saw, but they also had their own biases. You know, I, I won't get into my, my whole presentation because I'll take another 45 minutes. Um, but anyway, the, we all have our own biases that we bring to the eyepiece and modern CCD images of objects is, is one of the main ones. I, I've seen sketches amateurs have done uh, M51 that practically show all the same details that a Hubble image does. It's like, and they, 
you know, they didn't actually see that. They, they, they saw the general shape and they, their, their mind filled in the details. And it, it's, it's too easy. So how I guard against that is, um, one, I am double sure to check to see if I, if I uh, on, especially on, on faint details. If, if I can't, if, if I'm looking at something and I think I, I can barely see it, I'll shift my gaze to a different part of my field of view to see if I can perceive the same detail in a place it shouldn't be. And when, I, when, when that happens, I know, okay, my, my brain is trying to trick me. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, that, that's one technique. Another technique is just observing again and again, the same object over, over multiple nights. And sometimes I'll see on a really good night, you know, uh, that's something I thought I saw previously just isn't there. Um, it's not there. And so I have to go back and erase that, that detail. So there's, there's a, a real value in, in reobserving and reobserving and waiting for that, that really good night to come along to, to double check yourself. And, and third, it just comes down to personal honesty. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a, I mean, I, I do these sketches for my, my own benefit. I enjoy it. Like, like I mentioned previously, there's, um, you know, now I, you know, I've been writing for Sky and Telescope for 10 years now. And so, you know, I want my, what I put out into the public to be as accurate as I can make it. Uh, I don't want to include extraneous things that I probably didn't see. I just, now that's, that's not gonna be useful for anyone. And uh, yeah, so personal honesty, is what it comes down to double checking my results and, um, and, and trying to put aside what I know is there by concentrating on what I can actually see. Yes, you know, it's, it's an imperfect system because our, our brains like to have a structure to things that it's looking at. And uh, there, there's no way to get around the, the photographic bias of today. Great, thank you. Um, and we next have a question from Steve Hubbard. And he asks, is it possible to sketch objects other than nebula? Oh, sure. Yeah, I, I've sketched pretty much it, everything. The, the easiest object to sketch is a uh, quasar. Um, it's a, pretty much the, the faintest little dot you can put on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, uh, globular clusters are the most difficult. Um, I've only attempted one accurate drawing of a globular cluster, M5, um, mostly because of the, the, the two variable stars, um, V84 and, and V42. Um, but that's, that, that's, that's really tedious. But the end result is pretty cool looking. Um, galaxies, mostly lots of galaxies. Most of what's up there is galaxies. Planetary nebulae. Um, and every kind of object. I'm probably forgetting something, but yeah, you can you can draw anything. Thank you. And now we have um, a couple of questions from Alan Kay. Um, do you use pa a paper smudge stick to stop your fingers getting covered in pencil? No, uh, no, I don't. Um, I've I've never used a, uh, a smudge stick uh, for, in my drawings, um, mostly because my, my finger works so well. Uh, when, when I'm at the telescope and I'm using my finger to, to smudge, you know, I just, every so often, I'll just swipe that finger on my pant leg <laughs> so it doesn't get built up full of, uh, of graphite and I end up scratching my nose and I end up with a big smudge there. Um, now, I know a lot of people like smudge sticks. They, they, they work great. It's just one more thing for me to, to, to futz around with at the telescope. And, yeah, and that's why I like to use my finger because, pardon the pun, it's always handy. 
<laughs> yes, very, <laughs> very true. But <laughs> you don't find you right. end up with um, uh, lead on all sorts of bits of uh, telescope or clothing. Yes, exactly. Um, and, and not a question, but Alan Kay comments um, that he once drew Comet Austin after a number of clear nights. And his brother-in-law, who is also an astronomer, said that it was a good sketch of the wild duck, which was good as it showed that my sketch was an accurate representation of what he saw. Well, his brother-in-law was kind of mean, I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny though. Um, yeah, sometimes a sketch doesn't end up looking like what, what you, you want it to look like. But again, this isn't about art. Um, it's about re recording what you saw in a way that helps you see everything you can. That's, uh, that's the whole idea, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I, I, I very much agree. I've, done, I've not done lots of sketching, but I've done uh, some sketching and also some imaging. And I'd say kind of with the imaging, you tend to record a lot more detail, but I see more when I'm sketching. Yeah. Because yeah. you've really got to exactly. focus and concentrate. Well, thank, th thank you, Andy. I, I appreciate that, uh, that backup on that point. And, and really, I find that same thing all my friends say when they sketch. Um, that uh, it's just, they're just surprised at how much more they see. They, they, they're embarrassed to show their, their sketch to anyone. But they go, oh, gosh, I never knew I could see all that detail in, in whatever they were looking at. So, great. Well, hopefully this uh, inspire um, plenty of us to go out and uh, get the, um, the paper and pencils out to have a, have a fresh go at uh, sketching deep sky objects. Because I, I, I do concur, it's a very rewarding when you do it. And, and you do really kind of... It adds, adds a new element to, uh, to observing. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, good luck to everyone who gives it a try. And if you do, stick with it for a while. Don't, don't give up after one, one or two nights. You know, give, give, it, a, give it a year and, and see. You, know, you don't have to sketch everything you look at. To sketch something that, that looks interesting. You know, planets. You know, uh, uh, hopefully a nice new comet comes along. Sketch that. You know, whatever it is. Yeah, thanks so much, Howard. That was a, a great talk. I hope it does inspire a few people to uh, to to do take up sketching or 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 do more sketching or to um, even send in their sketches. I, I get we get a few sketches from members, but uh, they are a bit few and far between. And uh, I, I always welcome them from from any of our members to submit observations. Very good. And, yeah, and thank you. It's really nice to see see sketch and sketches come in, and uh, I think. Um, lots of people have different techniques so it's, it was really interesting to hear more about your techniques and uh, and how you make such marvelous sketches that uh, that we've, we've we've seen um I, I, I put your um your website address on the uh, on the chat so if anyone wants to uh, to pick that up um they can pick that up off the chat uh, and uh, i guess it'll be on the replays as well when uh, people want to uh, to look that up again um so i thought i'd just say Finally, thank you again, Howard. Thanks very much for, for your excellent presentation tonight. Um, I'd also like to have a quick thanks to Hazel Collett, who's been organising the programme of these webinars, um, and to Andy for uh, organising all of the, the IT support tonight, uh, uh, without whose help uh, uh, none, of the, <laughs> none of these would happen, really. Um, thanks very much, Andy. Um, and, and just a, a follow up on the Wednesday webinars. We will be continuing the season through into the summer. Uh, and uh, the next Wednesday one will be on the 14th of July. And uh, John Rogers, who's the director of our Jupiter section, will be talking on uh, or has a, a webinar entitled Jupiter Rising. So I presume that must mean that Jupiter is heading back to, into, the, into, the, into the night sky. Um, so we're, we should all be all look forward to that as well. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much, um, Howard. Thanks, everyone. For My pleasure. Ending tonight. Thank you. And Thank you for having me. We'll uh, look forward to, to seeing everyone again sometime soon. Very good. Thank Thanks, you. Good Colin. evening to everyone. Thank, Thank you, you Howard. Cheers. Thanks very much, Howard. Very and well. for the early morning presentation with you as well. <laughs> very good. Yeah, that was worthwhile. <laughs> very excellent. So, 
Yeah, again, thank you guys. I uh, really appreciated the opportunity to, to uh, give this presentation to the BAA. And uh, like, I, like I mentioned, I really do have a whole separate presentation about observing bias. So if that's ever something that you're interested in, I'd be happy to present that as well so at some point. I think we'll, we'll, we'll I'll, I'll make a note of that and uh, we'll see what we can <coughs> schedule, schedule you in to do that one. Okay, be my pleasure. That would be great. Yeah, <laughs> sounds very worthwhile. Yeah. All right. Well, Thanks, very Jim. good. Cheers, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Yep. Have a good day, Howard. You too. Okay. Bye then, everyone. Good night.